a while back, I had a student that um, he, every year, he would take his picture in for the yearbook, and then he would go down during retake day. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. No, no, no. no, 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 no. Sure. Fine. Go on, you got it. It's the happiest I've ever looked in my life. <laughs> Whoa! <laughs> That's for what? Which birthday is that? 2015. You didn't get the party hat. Yeah. 10th birthday? 9th birthday. Yeah. Nine and a half. <laughs> anyway, okay, so I had this student, he would, uh, he would go get his picture taken. Sure. And uh, like on the original picture day, and then on the retake day, he would go down and do and put his like because like the way they did it before, you had to like write in your name like if you're gonna get a retake, and he would use his middle name as his first name, <laughs> and so he he would be showing up in the yearbook twice, <laughs> and he convinced people that he had a twin in the building. <laughs> I still remember this. I wonder if there's. Awesome. Um, he's probably back in here. His last name was Wheeler. It would be Wheeler. Oh, there's more in Wheeler. Wheeler the Wheeler. Younger sister. Maybe. Oh, I bet he was a senior. <laughs> No I have to look. I'll report back. <laughs> All right, anyway, section 4.3, how derivatives affect the shape of the graph. So we talked yesterday, we began to talk about, okay, if you know what the derivative is, if you can actually calculate a numerical value of the derivative, that'll tell you something about the original graph. And remember that the derivative, since the derivative is equivalent to the slope, since the derivative is equivalent to the slope, then the derivative is going to be, hold on, since the derivative is equivalent to the slope, then the derivative will tell you whether the slope is positive or negative. And that'll tell you whether the original equation is increasing or decreasing, right? And there are points on the graph where you say, well, the derivative is zero, so therefore it's got to be a maximum or minimum value. And then we said, okay, this is the increase-decrease test, right? This is the ID test, as the book calls it. Um, find where the function is increasing and decreasing and find the critical values. And then you basically create a number line for yourself, pick some tested values, and then you say, well, I know it's decreasing and increasing on certain intervals. Now, what we can say beyond that is what's called the first derivative test. If you know that a function is decreasing, then increasing on the left and right side of a critical value, then you can say that that critical value is indeed a local maximum or minimum value. So if it's decreasing, then increasing, you know it's got to be a local minimum. If it's increasing, then decreasing, then you know it's got to be a local maximum. So our next problem says, find the local maximum of the same maximum and minimum values of the, the same function we had in example one. So all I'm going to do is I am going to just screen capture off this piece of information because this is the only thing that we need out of the increase-decrease test. I'm going to say go to the original page, the current page. Come on. Come on, buddy. It's okay. I know it's Wednesday. You'll be all right. Okay. Oh, that's big. <laughs> Not messing around with that screenshot. Okay. Okay. So we know this from this fun from uh, example one, right? We know that it's decreasing on an interval from negative negative infinity to one, negative one or two. It's increasing in an interval from negative one to zero. It's decreasing from zero to two, and then increasing again from two to infinity. Okay. Our first derivative tells us this, right? If it is decreasing, then it increasing. What is happening at negative one? Decreasing, then increasing. What is happening at negative one? It's a local minimum. So I can say local minimum 
at negative 1. Do I know what that minimum actually is yet? No. I'll have to run that through the original function, right? I'll have to go back and, and run that through the original function. I'll have to basically find the y value. It's telling me where the x values are occurring. Then I can say, well, here, if it's increasing from negative 1 to 0, and then it flips at 0, and it says from 0 to 2, it starts to decrease. What is that telling you at 0? It's a local maximum. And then decreasing from 0 to 2, and at 2 it flips to increasing, I can say that there is a local minimum because it's decreasing, then increasing at 2. And then you just evaluate what it is, right? I know it's at those values, so let's just evaluate at negative 1. Well, this would be... Uh, negative, th oh, I got to be careful here. This would be th positive three, positive four, because the negative still works for it to the third. Um, so three plus four, which would be seven, minus 12, which would be negative five, and then plus five would be zero. So it's equivalent to zero. The actual local minimum is zero, and it occurs at negative one. And all I'm doing there is running it through my original function. Am I running it through my derivative? No. What would happen if I ran negative one through my derivative? It would be, it would always come out zero. Actually, this is a bad example to say because it comes out zero. Um, but if I ever run a critical value th back through my derivative, it should come out zero. That's where we got these numbers. The reason I say this is because as we get further, as we get deeper into these things, there's the first derivative test, there's a second derivative test, there's more tests that we use. And they all require you to plug things in in a different way, in a, in a different place. Be very clear about where things go. That it can get a little confusing. Okay, so we know there's a local maximum of zero, uh, zero comma five. And we know there's a local minimum at two. Um, local minimum at two. I just got to plug this in, right? Hey, you know what we could use to plug it in? Throwback. Oh, what? No. Synthetic substitution? What? What? You don't like this stuff? This is so easy. Negative 27. Remember? Bring it down. Multiply, add. Multiply, add. Multiply, add. Multiply, add. That's easier than doing it in your calculator. Questions about that? So the, the first derivative test requires you to use the increase-decrease test. Okay? You, it's a, they say it's a consequence of the increase-decrease test. All right. Find the local maximum and minimum values for the function. Now, how is this different from the, uh, you know, from the closed interval test? Well, what did the closed interval test do? It found the absolute maximum and minimum values, right? It found the absolute maximum and minimum values. For our purposes here, I'm looking for the locals. Now, this is a closed interval, correct? This is a closed interval. Can an endpoint on a closed interval be a local? No. So I don't need to test the endpoints here. I only need to test the critical values. So I'm going to find G prime which is 1 plus 2 cosine x. And then I'm going to say, well, I've got to find where 1 plus 2 cosine x equals 0. I subtract over the 1, divide by 2, I get cosine x 
is equal to negative one half. So x is equal to the inverse cosine of negative one half. What angle has a cosine of negative one half? It's got to be in the second quadrant, right? Addison? That's true, but it's got to be in the second quadrant, right? You think it's 120? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. Okay, so think about the unit circle here. Um, the, the x value is the 1 half, right? Not the y value, but the x value. Which is bigger, radical 3 over 2 or 1 half? Radical 3 over 2. So the x value is the smaller one here. That's the angle that we're looking for. Okay, that is the angle for, that we are looking for. Um, so what is that angle? Which one is that one? Pi over... What is it? Oh, come on, people. 2 pi over 3. Two pi over three. So what is that in degrees? What is the pi over three family in degrees? The 60s. Yeah. What's that? Yes. I was right. Yeah, but in radians, come on. Okay, where's the other location that this is going to happen along a full rotation? Can you get it? What is that? That's two pi over three. <laughs> Four pi over three. Uh, your algebra two and pre calc three is a little bit All right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I know. Hurts my heart. Okay. Um, now, we got 2 pi over 3 and 4 pi over 3, right? These are the possibilities of my local maximums and minimums. Okay. So I make a number line here, and I say I want something at 2 pi over 3, and I want something at 4 pi over 3. So let's pick some easy values to plug in here. Let's pick some uh, test and, uh, testing values. Uh, let's pick 0, let's pick pi, and let's pick 2 pi. And again, I'm just going to run these values through my derivative, right? You're, you're finding out when the slope is positive or negative. So you're going to run those values through my derivative. So if I've got 1 plus 2 cosine 0, do I care about the fact that it comes out as 3? No, I care about the fact that it's positive 3. What do you think is going to happen at pi? Positive or negative? Negative. Let's double check. 1 plus 2 cosine pi. Yep. Negative. What do you think is going to happen at 2 pi? Positive. Well, because it's the same as 0, right? It's going to come out as 3. Okay, now, I don't need to state the increase-decrease test, right? I don't need to state the increase-decrease test because that's not what I'm after. I'm after what the local maximum and minimum are minimum r. So I can say definitively, because this is increase to decrease, this is going up, then coming down, 2 pi over 3, there is a local increase to decrease max at 2 pi over 3. And then there is a local, okay, decrease to increase minimum at 4 pi over 3. And then you just run those values through. Okay, I've got 2, I'm going to put this in parentheses here for that so I can do it again. 2 pi over 3 plus 2 times the sine of 2 pi over 3. 2 pi over 3. And again, I'm not going through my derivative. I'm going back into my original because I'm seeing what the y value is. I'm actually seeing that the highest point I could have there is, well, not total highest, but 
local maximum is 3.83. It's probably some fancy exact values with radicals and stuff, but it didn't tell me exact values. Uh, same thing here, but now I'm going to use 4 pi over 3. So the local minimum value is 2.46. And it's occurring at 4 pi over 3. Questions about that? All right. Okay, so that's the that's f prime. That's the first derivative. So what does the second derivative say? What does the rate of change of the rate of change say? What, do, what does the derivative of the slope actually mean about the graph? This figure down here shows the graphs of two increasing functions from A to B. Both graphs join point A to point B, but they look different because they bend in different manners. How can we distinguish between these two types of behavior? We are going to call them concave upward and concave downward. Concave upward and concave downward. The graph of F, if, if the graph of F lies above all of its tangents on an interval i, then it is called concave upward. So then it is called concave upward. Let's dissect that a little bit. If the graph of the function lies above all of its tangents on an interval, meaning, take a look at all the tangents here. If I draw all the tangents here, does this lie above all those tangents? Yes. So this is concave upward. Period in there. Concave upward. If all of the tangents, yeah. Wait a sec. Wait a sec. Wait a sec. Wait a sec. If I do, I have these backward here. No, I have that right. Okay, good. This would be concave down. For a minute, I was like, wait a second. Am I reading this down backward? Uh, this would be concave down. Basically, the rule, because that can get a little funky. Like, that that kind of plays with your mind a little bit. Just played with my mind a little bit. Um, the best way that I think about this is if it turns into a smiley face. Yeah? If it turns into a smiley face, then it's concave upward. If it turns into a frowny face, then it's concave downward. Then it's concave downward. Make sense? That's the way I remember it. Because, you know, how, how else do you describe, describe well, it's, well, it's going to be like that, right? It's going it's to bend like that. Okay. Happy face. Concave up. Frowny face. Concave down. Okay. So just showing you some concave upwards and concave downwards pieces here. So obviously from point A to point B, that would be concave downward. Front right face. From point B to point C, concave upward. From point C to point D, concave downward. From point C to point, from D to E, concave upward. E to P, I just switched to P. Uh, concave upward, concave downward. It, and sometimes it might be slight. Sometimes, sometimes it might be just a little bit of a bend. Sometimes it's a very drastic bend. Like look at point D to, from point D to point E. That's a pretty drastic bend upward, right? Okay, so how do we test? How do we test? It's called the concavity test. If F double prime is greater than zero, then it's concave upward. If f double prime is less than zero, it's concave downward. If f double prime is greater than zero, then it's concave upward. If f double prime is less than zero, then it's concave downward. That's the concavity test. Double prime, right? This is the second derivative, not the first derivative, but the second derivative.
Now take a look here. And in specific, I'm going to just talk about point B. Because how do you know where it switches, right? How do you know where this switches? How do you know where it turns from concave upward to concave downward? Those points have a unique name. Kind of getting ahead of myself, but that's OK. We're going to define this in two slides here. But how do I know when that's going to change? Well, take a look at the slopes, right? Take a look at the slopes. If I look at the slope here to here, and I'm just concerned with that point in there, the slopes are staying negative, right? It's still going down and to the right. But what's the slope right here? And what's the slope? right here. And what's the slope? You know, you've got to think about how is it going to change in there? That piece in there, that, that point in there is called an inflection point, where it turns from starting to go concave upward to concave downward. You know where those are going to happen? Where the derivative equals, or sorry, where the second derivative, excuse me, where the second derivative equals zero where the second derivative equals zero. That's where you might get an infl inflection point. Where was the first derivative equal to zero? The maximum or minimum points, right? Where is the second derivative equal to zero? The inflection points. The inflection points. And that's what we're going to be looking at in there. First derivative tells you where the maximum or minimums could be. Second derivative zeros tells you where the inflection points and notice the wording that I'm going to say, where the inflection points could be. Just like the, um, just like the first derivative, you know, I could find where the derivatives are going to equal zero, but that doesn't necessarily tell me that it's going to be a local maximum or minimum at those values. I can also find where the second derivative is going to be equal to zero, but that doesn't necessarily tell me that there is an inflection point there. It just tells me that there could be an inflection there. So what do we have to do? We have to run this thing called the concavity test. If f double prime turns out positive, it's concave upward. If f double prime turns out negative, then it's concave downward. Um, I think it's really interesting, um, these types of graphs. This is called a logistic graph, okay, a logistic graph. We, uh, there were a ton of these graphs going on um, during the pandemic. And everybody was focused on when is the inflection point going to happen? Like all the scientists and all the epidemiologists were like, when is it going to take that turn? And in each peak or valley, or in each peak, you know, at each surge that we had, there was, there was a time where we could say, oh, we've reached this point where the total number of cases is topping out per day and then the total number of cases is dropping off. That graph can be related to something like this where we have total number of cases. You know, each of these peaks or valleys in the pandemic was, or each of these peaks, I guess I should say, was, okay, total number of cases per day, right? What if I change that total number of cases per day to total number of cases total, cumulative, rather than just per day, cumulative? Well, then that graph turns to something that looks a little bit more like this, right? And this graph here relates directly to this point in there, where the graph turns from concave upward from a happy face to a frowny face, right? In our eyes, if it's a pandemic, it's going a bit sad to happy. Uh, but in, for, for these points here, it's turning from concave upward to concave downward. And that inflection point corresponded directly to when the peak was going to come. I was, I was nerding out during the pandemic because you can actually run these calculations through your TI calculators, right? Uh, you can, you can, so I was inputting daily case counts, trying to, because you can actually calculate on your TI calculators 
like what the inflection point is going to be or what it could be if you're running that logistic curve. And I was trying to see if my calculations were actually going to come true. They never did. They just kept getting higher and higher. Whatever. Uh, because it's all statistics. You know, it, 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 it could happen, but it could not happen. Um, but anyway, this, this example that the book is giving shows population for Cyprian honeybees raised in an apiary. Um, does the rate of population increase change over time? When is the rate the highest? And what intervals is concave upward or concave downward? See, do you see the inflection point in here? Right? We see the inflection point in there. And what does that mean in this case? Well, it means that it's going from concave upward to concave downward. Something is happening at that inflection, inflection point to the honeybees, right? At some point, you know, maybe the hive is growing at maximum capacity at that point. And now the, 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 over time, the number of honeybees is starting to level off again. I'm growing at my fastest rate at that moment. I am growing at my fastest rate. The rate of change is at its highest. The rate of change is at its peak at that moment, which that was super important when we were talking about a pandemic. The rate of change, the rate of infection is growing at its maximum value at that moment, at that inflection point. But the good thing is, is after you get through that point, the rate of change starts to decrease. The rate of infection starts to decrease, right? For here, if I'm talking about rate of honeybees producing, well, I am increasing, 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 and then I don't want to say increasing. My rate of change is increasing, 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 and then my rate of change starts to decrease once I get through that inflection point, right? So when you're talking about the rate of change, you're talking about the derivative. When the derivative starts to increase, 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 and then when the derivative starts to decrease, 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 that is an inflection point, which is technically the second derivative. Okay? Um, so here's our formal definition of an inflection point. A point P on a curve is called an inflection point if F is, if F is continuous there and the curve changes from concave upward to concave downward or from concave downward to concave upward. This could work backward as well. right? I could go from concave downward to, co to concave upward or concave upward to concave downward. So that's what we're calling an inflection point, when the rate of change starts to increase or decrease on either side. In essence, what you do is basically do the increase-decrease test on the first derivative. You do the increase-decrease test on the first derivative to see where the inflection points occur. You do the increase-decrease test on your original function to see where the maximum and minimum values would occur. But then you do the increase-decrease test on your derivative to see where the inflection points would occur. They just called it something different because you can't call it like the increase-decrease test 2.0. Uh, it's called the concavity test. It'll tell you when it's going to be concave upward or when it's going to be concave downward. Um, they give that same diagram uh, in there, and but I already kind of talked through that, so I'm just going to get to the example. Does that sound okay? Okay, you do. All right. So let's sketch some graphs. You guys hate these problems in your homework. Mm -hmm. <laughs> One where I give you parameters and then you have to sketch the graph. Okay, so if the derivative is positive, if the derivative is positive, that's what this is saying, right? If the derivative is positive from negative one to negative infinity to one, what is that telling you if the derivative is positive from negative infinity to one? It's increasing, right? So this is going to be increasing. I'm going to kind of interpret date down here. Increasing from negative infinity to one. 
What is this piece telling me? The derivative is negative from 1 to infinity. So it's going to decrease from 1 to infinity. What does this combined tell me? If it's increasing until 1, and then it starts to decrease, it's a maximum value. It's increasing and then decreasing. So we can say these combined means that there is a local maximum at 1. Could be the absolute, but right now we just know that there's a local. Okay, bullet point 2 here. F double prime is positive from the interval negative infinity to negative 2. What does this statement tell me? Concave upwards, right? It's concave upwards from negative infinity to negative 2. That means there's a happy face from negative infinity until negative 2. It's also from 2 to infinity, so positive 2 to infinity. Okay, it's f double prime is negative from negative 2 to 2. Okay, so that means um, concave downward. I always abbrevi abbreviate concave upward CU and concave downward CU, or CD, excuse me. Concave downward from negative 2 to 2, which means there's a frowny face from negative 2 to 2. Okay, these statements combined tell me what is happening at negative 2. What is happening at negative 2? What type of point is there? Not a discontinuity. An inflection point. There is an inflection. Whoa. There is an inflection at 2. And also at negative, oh, I, I think I said negative, at negative and positive 2, right? I think I've kind of misspoke there, but that's true. Negative 2 and positive 2. That's not a coordinate, that's two places, right? There is an inflection point at 2, and there's an inflection point at negative 2. Okay, this third bullet point here, you know, we're kind of interpreting as we go. The limit as x goes, ooh, throwback, limits. The limit as x goes to negative infinity is equivalent to negative 2. What is this telling me? What is that st statement telling me? As I get further and further in, into the negatives, what's happening? It's leveling to negative 2. So there is a horizontal asymptote. At negative 2, uh, going to negative 2, y equals negative 2. And that's on the left, kind of making notes for myself. As I continue to negative infinity, it's going to level off to negative 2. As I continue to positive infinity, where is it going to level off? Yeah, horizontal asymptote. There is another horizontal asymptote at y equals 0. And that's on the right side, because I'm saying it's on the positive thing. So we're kind of like translating, right? We're, we're translating what this means to us. So now let's create a, a sketch. OK, important x values that we have. The smallest important x value that we have is negative 2, correct? So let's go negative 1, negative 2, negative 3, negative 4, positive 1, positive 2, positive 3, positive 4. Do I know what any of these y values are? Oh, I do know what a y value is. I do have a y value. There's a horizontal asymptote, right? So I know I've got to level off to negative 2 on the left. But my local maximums and minimums and stuff like that, Am I told, 
or my inflection points? Am I told what the y values to those things are? No. I, I, I'm not even told the original equation, so I can't even calculate them, right? I know where these are happening, what x values these are happening at, but that's all that I do know. Okay, so let's put a local maximum at 1. Uh, let's go 1 comma this. Let's put a, and it's going to increase from negative infinity to 1, but there's an inflection point at negative 2. So at negative 2, it's going to start to go from, let's put it right there. Now, I guess we should say this. On the left side, it's going to have to level off to negative 2. On the right side, it's going to have to level off to 0, right? I'm just making that a, a colored dotted line there so that we know on the right side it's going to asymptote over to the other side. The only other thing that I do know, is, so I know that it's not going to go underneath the x-axis on the right side, but I do know that there is an inflection point at 2. So let's put it right, right there. Now we can start to build. Okay, I know that it's got to be concave upward. And at that moment, it has to switch from concave upward to concave downward. I know it's got to top out at 1. It's going to go concave downward and then go back concave upward and level out to 0. Similar than last time. Questions about that? Those ones can get super tricky because now we've accumulated a lot of knowledge based on what the derivative is telling us, based on what the second derivative is telling us, based on what a limit is going to tell us. You know, so we've got to kind of sift through all of that and interpret all of those things. Um, let's do this second derivative test on Tuesday, shall we? Let's save this chunk for Tuesday, and then the rest of Tuesday will be worth it. Deal? This is where it gets, like, super interesting to me. Like, I get, man, I can't, I, I really kind of nerd out a little bit. That's the 4 2 assignment. Yeah. So the 4 1 assignment, or sorry, sorry, 4 3 assignment, you're going to have Monday as a work day. Or sorry, sorry, sorry. Tuesday as a work day. So it is kind of due Wednesday. Just next Wednesday. <laughs> yeah, watch this here. Or three assignment to Wednesday. Um, and don't, I, I don't know if I announced this to this class or not. Um, we will have a 4 1 to 4 3 quiz next Friday. Next Friday. So Tuesday will be a work day. And then Wednesday, I'm going to give you the quiz review. Thursday, we'll go over the quiz review. And then next Friday, we'll take a 4 1 and 4 2 quiz. I, think, I don't think we were stopping. <laughs>